Well, thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm, I'm glad it's in the morning. I'm still feeling uh, pretty fresh. Um, I just want to say that uh, it, was, it, was, it was great to be here because uh, when I got off the plane, it was, I haven't felt that warm temperature in a long time. I got the, I got the word uh, that in Ottawa, where I live, uh, there was a major snowstorm today, so uh, I'm happy, happy not to be there today. Um, so it was, a, it was real, real quite, a, quite exciting to come to talk about uh, farm uh, competitiveness and profitability because that really has been one of the key focuses of uh, Canadian policy uh, for the last number of years. And uh, as a result, we've done a fair bit of analysis on this, and so I hope to sh share some of that analysis with you today and to, to hope you, hopefully give you a little bit of insight in terms of how we, uh, we approach the, the farm income situation in Canada. So I'm sure, uh, given this is an Australian audience, you're all intimately familiar with uh, the structure of Canadian agriculture, but uh, just in case, I'm going to give you the, the brief overview before I get into the analysis. Um, like Australia, Canada is a, a, a very large country uh, area-wise, but a fairly small population. And as a result, uh, our agriculture sector is highly export-oriented. Um, so when it comes down to the, the structure of uh, the farms, uh, we had a, in 2006 about 230,000 farms in Canada. Um, about two-thirds of those had uh, less than $100,000 in sales. And those farms, that's the sort of the blue area on the, on the slide, um, and those farms, 65% of them accounted for less than 8% of sales. In contrast, our larger farms with uh, sales over $500,000 made up about 10% of uh, farms, but they uh, accounted for two-thirds of the value of production. So we can really see that um, the, a small number of uh, farms in Canada is really producing the vast majority of output. Um, now, one of the, the reason why I mention that is that our analysis is that shows that size really does uh, play an important role in uh, profitability. And what this chart is showing is the percentage of farms breaking even by various sales classes. So we have the very small farms on, on the left uh, going up to a million dollars and more in sales uh, on the right. And we show that for different commodities. Um, and what, what this shows is that there are the likelihood of being profitable um, uh, is significantly higher once you get over $100,000 in sales. Um, the first time I saw this chart, I found it quite surprising because I didn't think that we'd actually see such a flattening out of, uh, of the likelihood of being profitable once you got beyond uh, $100,000 in sales. Um, and this applies for most commodities, with the exception being grains and oil seeds, where we think uh, uh, there's continuing uh, economies of scales. Um, so what the implication here is that uh, we think that farms need to be at least a certain uh, size if, the, if they're likely to be uh, competitive. Um, now that being said, we, see, we do see farms that are profitable and unprofitable at all, all uh, farm sizes, but clearly uh, being large uh, is certainly a contributor. Now this slide here shows, uh, shows the situation when we exclude government payments. Um, the next slide, we have the same chart with uh, uh, with the government payments included. And I just want to show you this to show that uh, uh, gov the government has provided uh, significant levels of support in the last few years to the farm sector, and it's really helped them out in terms of their profitability, uh, given some of the tough uh, situations uh, they've uh, faced in the last little while. Um, but I want to come back to the point about um, um, it's not just about farm size. Um, what we do is we see, we see a significant amount of uh, variation in performance um, between the top 20% and the bottom 20% of uh, farms. And this, this relationship holds uh, regardless of farm size, regardless of commodity. Um, and what I'm, what I'm showing here on this chart here is the net operating income, so a measure of, uh, of uh, profitability for large uh, grain and oilseed farms in the province of Saskatchewan. So what we've tried to do is try to control for, um, for the size of operation, for the conditions they face to show that um, you know, you know that there are factors on the farm that may, make a difference, and what we see here is their their uh, rev uh, their net operating income per acre, and we see that the top performers have significantly higher uh, net operating income than their their uh, than their less successful counterparts. Um, I think this is a, a real example of uh, that uh, the the slide we saw earlier in uh, Philip Glide's presentation about the the production frontier that we see the top performers are, are doing quite well. And, um, and the bottom performers are, are quite struggling. And this, uh, this happens even in, in tough situations and in good years. Um, so one of the things we conclude from this is that while agriculture is certainly buffeted by many external factors that are beyond the control, whether they be weather, uh, volatility in uh, global markets, um, 
disease outbreaks or, or border closures, those are some of the, the pressures we've faced in Canada over the last, uh, over the last several years. Um, despite these, some farms consistently do well and some consistently uh, struggle. Uh, we conclude that, that armed farm decisions, um, while not the, the only factor, they play a key role in determining success. Um, so now from a policy, policy perspective, it's always sort of want, we want to understand what is, driving these, what is driving these differences. And when we look at it, what we see is we see differences both on the, on the revenue and on the expenses side. Um, now, the relative importance of revenues and expenses depends, uh, is, is differs uh, depending on which commodity we're looking at. But again, we're looking at Saskatchewan uh, grain farms here, and we see there are some differences in the, in the revenues. Now, unfortunately, we haven't quite been able to sort of unpack this even further to say, is it, is it, it yield differences? Is it the quality of the, the, the grains they're producing? Um, are they better able to market their products and get better prices for them? Um, so that's certainly an area where we're, uh, we're, we're continuing to investigate. Some of the things we do suspect, given some of the other analysis we've done, is we, we suspect that uh, the top performers are more responsive to um, market conditions and are better able to identify and take advantage of the opportunities they see. Um, we see here on the, the pulse crops that uh, the top performers are able to, to, to generate more revenue per acre. We also know that the top performers are, have uh, actually shifted uh, more into and have uh, more of their, uh, their, their acres in uh, pulse production as well. Um, now, controlling cost is also a key part of this, and we can see, again, these, are, these, these uh, farms here are facing similar soil conditions, facing similar climatic conditions. We can't control for everything, but we've tried to, to manage it, and we see significant uh, differences in, in the expenses per acre, uh, fertilizer, seed, fuel, machinery. Those are all um, uh, below. The one exception is uh, pesticides, where the top guys are, are um, actually producing, are, are expending more, and it's probably because they made a sort of a cost-benefit decision and felt that you know greater expenses on this side will generate more revenues. Um, looking at the expense side really sort of gives us some hope in, in terms of looking at the competitive situation. In that, if there's such a large gap uh, given existing technology, there is scope for. Um, for uh, Canadian farms, particularly the poor performance, to Im improve, uh, improve their, their income performance uh, given existing technologies. Um, again, what we don't know here is the, the extent that uh, differing uh, farm technologies uh, plays a role in this. Are the top guys, uh, we assume that they're, uh, they're using the, the latest and greatest uh, farm technologies to reap their, their benefits in making investments, but uh, at this point in time, we can't be certain. Um, the other interesting point is the other expenses column. That's uh, essentially their financial, their financial payments, their interest payments on, on their debt. And so we see a significant difference in there. So the financial management of the operation does uh, contribute quite, to the, quite a bit to the bottom line. Um, so that's the, 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 the farm operation itself. Um, but in Canada, our policies are mostly focused on farm income, such farm income and the performance of the farm. Um, but Farm income is only one part of the story for, uh, for farm families. And off-farm income has been playing, in Canada, has been playing an ever-increasing role uh, in the, the financial contribution to the farm family. And what this chart shows that in the last, in the 20 years between 1983 and 2003, while the incidence of negative net farm, in farm income has risen to close to 50%, we've seen a decline in low family income when you combine income from all sources to only about uh, 15%. So this divergence between the performance of farm income and low family income has really been driven by off-farm income, which includes off-farm salaries and wages uh, and off-farm investment income. Um, now this, co this, this does coincide with a general in trend in uh, the Canadian economy of uh, increasing dual income families, so the, the spouse of the farm operator might be uh, uh, having an off-farm job. But this clearly shows that uh, in thinking about uh, farm level performance and decisions of farm families, that it's not only the farm operation that counts, but it's their off-farm income as well. And the other thing that this shows is that farmers do have the ability to offset, at least in the Canadian context, uh, um, that they do have the ability to offset farm losses with, um, with their uh, off-farm income, and this can be considered um, a, a one way to diversify income to manage risk. Um, I find this, this, this chart to be quite striking because the last part of the financial situation um, is, is the balance sheet. Um, and between 2003 and 2008, uh, farm families' uh, net worth increased substantially. It's about a 50% increase uh, 
um, in over the five, six year period. Um, and what's, what I find most interesting about this is that that increase happened for both profitable operations and uh, unprofitable operations over that period of time. Um, now this is largely driven by, by increasing in land values. Um, for the profitable operations, their, their net worth in 2008 was about $1.4 million compared to $1 million for, uh, for uh, unprofitable farms. And just to put that into context, the average net worth of, uh, of all Canadian families is about $400,000. So this is, farm families have significantly higher net worth uh, than uh, non-farm families. And so when you look at this growth, um, this sort of puts into context a bit um, why we didn't see sort of mass exodus out of the, of the sector over those last uh, sort of 10 years with this so, so much uh, um, negative farm, inc farm income, because even if they're offsetting their, their losses through off-farm income, you might consider that maybe they're, they'd be better off leaving the sector and just focusing on off-farm income. But when you factor in the, the increase in net worth, there might be a sort of an economic, uh, you know, maybe a rational decision that says, well, if we can continue to have our net worth rise, uh, it's still, uh, still good to stay in the sector. So when we think about um, the performance of the financial sector, it's, it's important to think about the farm performance, the off-farm income, and uh, of course their wealth. And uh, just in conclusion, um, my presentation, so we sort of focused on the, on the farm level, but I think it's always uh, important to consider that uh, primary agriculture is part of a, a broader system, um, and they're connected through input suppliers that deal with the food uh, wholesale sector, and as well as uh, dealing directly with consumers. And so when we think about the competitive pressures that, uh, this, this, that uh, we in Canada face, um, whether it be sort of uh, emerging low-cost producers coming from Brazil, uh, Argentina, the fact that uh, our traditional market in the U.S. is not going to be the main source of growth uh, in the coming years. It's going to be in the developing countries uh, as they're with, the, with the major population as their income grows. Um, we've had to deal with an appreciation of the dollar and volatile commodity markets. Um, all these factors combined saying that, that, that looking ahead, there are going to be pressures in the sector. And one of the things that we think is important for, for, for the future competitiveness of our sector, not just looking at the efficiency of the operation, but also making sure we, that uh, the producers have a better understanding of the attributes that, uh, that the final consumers and uh, the retailers and wholesalers are looking for. And so to be successful in the future, yes, the farmer is going to continue to have to be um, paying attention to their operation, but increasingly so, they're going to have to be pay, paying attention to the developments in the market to make sure that they're producing uh, what the markets want. Um, so hopefully, um, hopefully this is giving you a bit of insight in terms of how we think about the issues in uh, Canada. And thank you very much.